Have you ever been checking the physics archive and just scrolling through the AMO physics papers and you just see that every single AMO experiment is done with rubidium? Have you even ever heard of rubidium? Why rubidium? Why is rubidium a physicist's favorite element to use when they're doing these fundamental physics experiments? It's so weird, right? Let me read you a few titles that have been just the past few months from the physics archive. Are you ready? Rabi oscillations at three photon laser excitation of a single rubidium Rydberg atom in an optical dipole trap. Spontaneous symmetry breaking of an optical polarization state in a polarization selective nonlinear resonator where they use atomic rubidium. Revisiting collisional broadening of rubidium 85 Rydberg levels, conclusions for vapor cell manufacture. A triaxial vectorization technique for a single beam zero field atomic magnetometer to suppress cross axis projection error, where the magnetometer used in this study was a rubidium magnetometer. Why? Why, why is it always rubidium? Here's some more. Rydberg electromagnetically induced transparency of rubidium 85 vapor in argon, neon, and nitrogen gases. Collinear optical two-dimensional coherence spectroscopy with fluorescence detection at 5 kHz repetition rate, where they used a rubidium vapor. Generation of 480 nanometer picosecond pulses for ultra-fast excitation of Rydberg atoms, where those Rydberg atoms are rubidium. Interaction of vector light beams with atoms exposed as a time-dependent magnetic field where the atoms are rubidium. Precise synchronization of a free-running rubidium atomic clock with GPS time for applications in experimental particle physics. It's always rubidium. Isn't that interesting? Why? Why? Look at the periodic table. These physicists, they have access to all of these wonder- well, most of these wonderful elements. Why are they specifically choosing rubidium for all of these experiments? That's so wild. If you look at all those websites that list the periodic table of elements, they will say rubidium has little use. It's not needed in the human body and it has little industrial application. And yet physicists are just using it. It's wild. It's really interesting. Rubidium is element number 37, which means it has 37 protons. There are two naturally found isotopes of rubidium on Earth, rubidium 85, which is stable, and rubidium 87, which is slightly radioactive with a half-life of 50 billion with a B years. Rubidium is, is not that common. It's not naturally found by itself. It's only found in minerals and salts, and rubidium is not that common of an element on Earth. It makes up 0.05% of the Earth's crust. So it's not like it's just super abundant and easy to use, and that's why they're grabbing it. Rubidium was discovered by platonic best friend roommates Gustav Kirchhoff and Robert Bunsen in 1861 using their flame spectrometer. I think I've talked about them and spectra in a video. I have talked about the discovery of spectra and spectroscopy in a video called Applied Quantum Mechanics. Um, they, they invented this technique and they discovered cesium in 1860 and then rubidium in 1861. And it is called rubidium because they did this flame spectroscopy and the emission spectra of rubidium has really bright red lines. So the Latin word rubidius, which means like super deep red, like ruby red, is how you get rubidium. I actually bought some rubidium for this video. So I went down this whole rabbit hole of where to buy like elements. And there are a whole bunch of people who as hobbyists collect elements to put in like their own periodic tables like on their wall. And this is a very cool, fun hobby. And on Reddit, I saw people recommend this company Luciteria, which I'll link below, which is where I bought some rubidium with my own money, but they actually have a lot of cool stuff. This isn't an ad. It's not sponsored. I just want to show you some of the stuff. Like you can buy blocks like this. I always pronounce this one wrong. Euterbium. Isn't that so cool? It's in like a little acrylic disc and you can just buy like blocks of metal. Like this is niobium. And I think this is the type of thing that's not really for science. This is for like education and artistic display. Isn't it beautiful? So the reason I bought from this company is because they are the only place I saw rubidium for sale where, well, let me just show you. I don't know. Can you make it out? Focus on the rubidium. It's a little cube that they have etched like a little periodic symbol into and it's so cool 
Oh my gosh, isn't that so beautiful? It's rubidium. I have some rubidium right here. We could do some atomic physics, I guess. This is not sponsored. Thank you so much, Patreon, for allowing me to buy and show some rubidium. It's just a really soft silver metal. Uh, it also has a pretty low melting point. It melts at 100 degrees Fahrenheit, or 103 degrees Fahrenheit. What is that in Celsius? Like 68 degrees Celsius? So um, I don't want to melt it. Well, I actually really do want to melt it. I really want to melt it, but I'm not going to because then it will lose its shape and its beautiful little etching. I should also mention that rubidium will react in air. It will like spontaneously ignite and start a fire. Uh, you usually store rubidium in an oil or an inert gas to prevent that from happening. Uh, it also reacts violently with water. I'll try to find a video of someone throwing some rubidium into some water so you can see. That was rubidium. Let's see that again. Um, but don't like lick it or anything because your, your face would ignite. Um, I don't know, I'm not a doctor. So looking at this periodic table again, what we just learned about rubidium does not explain anything about why physicists would just love to have rubidium around all the time. So instead, let's think of this from like the experimentalist point of view, and you're going to do like a fundamental quantum mechanics experiment. If you know the quantum numbers of the material you're looking at, you can use the Schrodinger equation to uniquely describe its physical properties and its motion in space, right? You can think of the Schrodinger equation in quantum mechanics as akin to like Newton's second law in kinematics, right? If you, if you know enough information about the object, you can predict what it's gonna do. You can understand its properties. Let's let's look at the only solvable Schrodinger equation, that for the hydrogen atom. Not a lot of detail because I already did a video on that. So instead, we're just going to do the highlights of the Schrodinger equation for the hydrogen atom. So the Schrodinger equation looks like this. You need a Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian will describe the kinetic energy of the system and also the potential or the potential energy that that system lives in. So. For a hydrogen atom, you have the kinetic energy of the nucleus, which is just a proton, the kinetic energy of that single electron, plus the potential well that the nucleus generates for the electron. It looks like this. You can make an assumption that the nucleus is static. The kinetic energy of that should be very, 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 very low compared to the very quickly moving electron around the proton, right? So you can reduce the, that equation further to this. So you have your Hamiltonian that looks like this and you shove it into your Schrodinger equation and then you do all the math stuff I did in that other video. So you, you do your spherical harmonics, you do your separation of variables, you have a power series solution and then you get a result, an answer to the Schrodinger equation for the hydrogen atom. And this is the only one you can just solve analytically on paper. Just this one. Everything else is done with a computer and making numerical assumptions about the system. So let's look at our periodic table again and look at the leftmost line. I'm not a chemist. This is like group one and you have hydrogen and then your alkali metals. All of your alkali metals, like hydrogen, have one unpaired electron in their outermost shell. So what you can do when you're doing the Schrodinger equation for these alkali metals is make a very big assumption that these are hydrogen-like or hydrogenic. Is that the word? So your hydrogen atom looks like this, and you can solve this equation, but your rubidium looks like this. Well, but what if you assume that the kinetic energy from all those electrons would kind of cancel out, and their motion relative to the system wouldn't matter, and instead you modeled your rubidium atom hydrogenically, hydrogen-like, and you just said, okay, we have a big nucleus surrounded by one electron, and then you tried to solve your Schrodinger equation with that Hamiltonian. If you know the quantum numbers of your system, you can solve the Schrodinger equation and you can know the properties of that system. So you need a Hamiltonian for this guy, right? You have the kinetic energy of the nucleus, the kinetic energy of that one electron that you're accounting for, and then the potential 
that is caused by the nuclei on the electron. So again, we can make the assumption that our nuclei is static compared to our electron, which is bouncing around very rapidly. And we're ignoring all of the paired electrons. We're saying those are gonna cancel out and we just have one unpaired electron at the end. So we can just make that the same kinetic energy for one electron, just like the hydrogen atom. And then we have the potential induced by the nuclei. We can just add a little Z to that because that nuclei is bigger. It's gonna have a larger effect. And what do you know? This Hamiltonian is very, very similar to our hydrogen atom Hamiltonian, which means the solutions to the Schrodinger equation are very, very similar, so, which means when we look at these hydrogen-like atoms in a lab, we know exactly how they're gonna behave. We can predict their quantum mechanical behavior, so therefore they're very, very useful in experiments. We know what they're gonna do. We understand how they behave under the rules of quantum mechanics. We can use them to test quantum mechanical principles. That's why we always, wait, wait, why do we always see rubidium? There's a whole bunch of alkali metals that should all have similar solutions to the Schrodinger equation. Why is it always rubidium? We haven't answered the question yet. So look at this table of the properties of alkali metals. Like generally, as you increase atomic number, abundance goes down, um, density goes up, melting point goes down, stuff like that. If you look at the electron configuration, they all have that one unpaired electron in the outer shell, which means they all have a Schrodinger equation that we can approximately solve because they are all hydrogen-like. But we need to think about what would be most useful in a lab setting. So if you're, if you're talking about a simple basement lab, the thing that's really nice about rubidium is that you can get this small sample and you can heat it in a very small oven to its boiling point, which is like 1400 degrees Fahrenheit. And you can have this rubidium vapor. It's easily accessible. It's in a small contained experiment and you can do like whatever your little AMO physicist hearts desire. Of course, people can and do also use cesium. Like there are cesium atomic clocks. However, cesium is harder to get a hold of. It's a little bit harder to handle. One thing about cesium though is when you start with a cesium metal and you turn it into a cesium vapor, it, it, it is much more dense than a rubidium vapor, which means it could be more difficult to use in an experiment. So people do use cesium, but they kind of lean towards rubidium. On the other hand, you have potassium, which is easier to get than rubidium. However, when you heat potassium to the temperatures that you want in these experiments, it starts interacting with the glass. So all of these cells are in little glass ampules or whatever you're using for your experiment, and you can't have it interacting with it because that, that will ruin your experiment. So it's kind of a Goldilocks situation where they discovered the usefulness of rubidium and now it's always rubidium. It's just always rubidium. Rubidium has no, that I know of, useful like industry or technological applications. It's purely for fundamental physics research and it's everywhere all the time. Like, have you ever heard of anyone using rubidium? O only in physics, it seems like. So why is it always rubidium? The simplest answer is that it's hydrogen-like and because we can solve a Schrodinger equation, we can drive it into specific quantum mechanical states and we can use it to study systems, to study fundamental quantum mechanics questions, to study properties of materials. Also, it's specific properties like melting point and stuff and its abundance make it easy to use in the lab. And because it's easy and available and also it's hydrogen-like, that's what they use. And that's the answer to why it's always rubidium. So I have talked about using rubidium for optical pumping in this video I made about glass a while ago. Rubidium is also used a lot in laser cooling. So if you have a gas of rubidium and you want to slow it down and make it very cold, remember cooling a gas means slowing down its velocities, you shoot it with a bunch of lasers. So you have a rubidium atom, you shoot it with the exact wavelength of laser you know that will cause the rubidium to absorb that light and elect that electron will jump to a higher shell, which will slow the atom down and then the electron will fall and emit that photon. And because rubidium is such a nice little example of an atom, 
you know exactly what wavelength to use, and it's often used in cooling experiments. Rubidium and also cesium are used to tune atomic clocks, which are also very important for all physics experiments because you want the most accurate time that you can get, and the way to do that is with an atomic clock. Uh, you can use rubidium lasers to produce helium-3. But I think the most famous experiment with rubidium was in 1995 at Jilla in UC Boulder where Eric Cornell and Carl Wyman cooled rubidium to create the first Bose-Einstein condensate, which until that point had been like a hypothetical type of matter. And then like a month later at MIT, Wolfgang Ketterl did the same thing with sodium, also an alkali metal. He cooled it into a Bose-Einstein condensate. And so in 2001, Eric Cornell, Carl Weinman, and Wolfgang Ketterl got the Nobel Prize in Physics for creating the first Bose-Einstein condensate, all because of rubidium and also other alkali metals and quantum mechanics, I guess. Do you guys want to hear my Eric Cornell story? So Eric Cornell is at Jilla and he's a very famous physicist and Jilla is the most bestest place in America to do atomic physics experiments. And I was there as a postdoc in theoretical astrophysics and I, I love Eric Cornell. I love atomic physics. So of course I knew all this stuff that was going on and I had attended a talk by Eric Cornell and he's a great speaker. Like, of course he's brilliant and awesome, but he was very funny and he was really good at explaining stuff. And then like months later, I was with a friend in a coffee shop, hi Maria, and <laughs> Eric Cornell came in to order coffee and I said, oh my gosh, that's Eric Cornell. And he looked at me and he was just like, yeah, hi. And then he ordered coffee and left and I died and now I'm dead, so. <laughs>